Good day, my dear investors. On Friday, I discussed how debt is a key risk component to the markets. I further said that there are other components, in my view, that create risk in the markets, that is valuation, extremely high book values, the notion that stocks can only go up and also real estate, and that if you just invest in index funds, put your money in index funds, you are well diversified and you will do well over time. So those are the key components of my risk perception over the markets and what can happen. So today we're going to talk about valuations and at the end of the risk series, I'm going to tell you exactly what will be the best investing strategy and what to do from a very positive, but based on knowledge and accumulation of facts, what exactly you have to do in order to do well when investing over the next 20 years. But the key is to understanding the risk. So let's talk about valuations and how those create risk when investing. Going back to Buffett, he says a lot of things, but most of the things he says is sound eternal investment knowledge. And one of the things that he stopped constantly repeating because he probably got tired of that is that your return on investment will be perfectly correlated with the earnings a company produces over time. So your return, corporate earnings. The valuation can go up and down in cycles as it always does market cycles. But as you're a long-term investor, your long-term return will be related to earnings. So the focus is, okay, what are the earnings and what am I paying? What's the price I'm paying for those earnings? That is the valuation, the price to earnings ratio. If we look at the S&P 500, the current price to earnings ratio is 25.13 and it has been higher only a few times in history, somewhere in the 1800s still in the dot-com bubble and of course in 2009 because S&P 500 earnings were very, very low and that's why the price earnings ratio was high. Okay, but price earnings ratio tell us, okay, they are really a static factor. So you have to see how will that dynamically evolve over time. If the price earnings ratio is 25, the expected earnings will be 4%. However, if we look at the growth of SAP 500 earnings, we can see that it's always volatile. Now it is 20% looking back to last year, but it was negative in 2016, it was almost negative in 2013, it was very, very negative, 90% decline in 2009. Similarly, 50% decline in 2002 when the last two recessions were. So the next recession, we can expect again a drop of 50, 60, 70%. So don't expect that S&P 500 earnings grow 20% over the next five, 10 years, because that never happened as you can see on this chart and will never happen, probably. This market is so crazy that anything can happen. But okay, going back to the S&P 500 earnings growth in 19, 19- 80. The S&P 500 adjusted for inflation here, earnings were 50. Now they are 106.95, 107. If I calculate the yearly growth over those 38 years, I'm at 2%. So S&P 500 earnings grew in the last 38 years, 2% per year. What does this mean? This means that you can expect earnings to grow alongside the economy perhaps a little bit lower, perhaps a little bit faster. The economy is expected to grow at 2-3% over the very long term. And with ups and downs, you can expect S&P 500 earnings to grow at that rate. So the return that you get from buying now is 4% and the growth earnings growth is 2-3% over the long term. This means that your long, long, long term return from stocks will be 4-5%, which is very low from a historical perspective and we'll dig deeper in a moment. This is what I want to show you. The S&P 500 level and price to earnings ratio. If I start from the points, the earnings of the S&P 500 in points is 107. This means that at the price earnings ratio of 50, the S&P 500 should be above 5,000. At the price earnings ratio of 30, it should be above 3,000. At the price earnings ratio of 20, above around 2,000, 2,140. Price earnings ratio of 10 at current earnings, the S&P 500 should be at 1,000, 1,070 points. So that's the risk from a valuation perspective. And whatever, if you look at it from a dynamic market cycle, that's a huge risk because 
If the required earnings from the S&P 500 are 10% somewhere in the next 10 years, the S&P 500 will be at 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 points. As crazy as that might look now, of course, adjusted for inflation, but inflation is something you have to think about. So as crazy as that might look now, that's a huge risk for just investing in the markets. Additionally, the bonds yields are increasing. So let's say you are the manager of the Norwegian pension fund and you have your exposure to the United States and you look, okay, S&P 500 will give me 4%, but now you see the 10 year treasury will give me 3%, next year, let's say 4%. And then the fund manager of the Norwegian fund will say, okay, the risk is, I need to adjust that for risks. I want now 6% from the S&P 500 because I can get 4% for exposure to the US economy through bonds. This means that the required earnings increase 50%, which means that the valuation drops from the current 25 to 16. That means that if the required earnings yield from the S&P 500 goes to just 6%, just 6%, not 12, not 26, the S&P 500 drops to 1,700 points. And that's a risk for the general market. If we look at a global perspective, global developed perspective, we can see here the third column, the price to earnings ratio in Brazil is 21, Finland 22, Indonesia 22, UK 22, Belgium 23 almost, Philippines 23, United States 24 here, data vary a little bit around databases, Norway 24, Switzerland 26, India 26, other emerging markets 28, emerging America 29. Italy, 30 say, the highest price to earnings ratio in the world with the current election, it will be even better. <laughs> Nevertheless, you can see how extremely high are the valuations. And the second column here, perhaps even more important, is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, which takes 10 year average earnings and that metric is even higher for the US and it is at 32. And let me show you this. This is simply all you need to know about investing, especially in the long term. These are the returns. On the X axis, you have the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. When it is 10, you can on average expect returns, as you can see from all markets around the world, of around 10% per year for the forthcoming 15 years. On the Y axis, you have the returns. When the CAPE ratio is around 20, which means that the earnings yield is around 5%, you can see that the returns over the next 15 years are around 4%. And the higher the CAPE is, the lower are the returns. And whenever the CAPE ratio is above 30, there is a bigger likelihood that the returns will be negative over the long term. And you can see how whenever the CAPE was above 40, there are few exceptions when returns were barely positive over the 15 years in all equity markets, however, you can expect negative returns on a high CAPE ratio of at least returns not above 4%. When the CAPE was above 20, the US market hasn't seen returns of above 4, 5%. So that's it. That's a huge risk for long-term investors, pension funds, whatever. However, you are not a mutual fund, which means that if you are smart, you can carefully pick when to invest, where to invest, and how to invest. I'm going to continue with my series on risk because that risk will lead us to the final video of the series when we will tell, okay, these are the risks, ta 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 ta, which means that that is exactly what you have to watch in order to successfully invest over the very, very long term. Looking forward to your comments. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.